All right. Well, I have the happy news that um, Earl has joined us and he's going to be available to speak with you. I just want to check, make sure and everyone can see the, the cover slide for Earl's presentation on their screen. That looks good to be there, Allie. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to go on mute and Gina, take it away for Earl. Okay. Well, actually, I will uh, finish my introduction or as the Earl, as we all seem to know, needs no introduction. Uh, but his bio, biography, biography is in your program nonetheless. His unique and vast knowledge of Maine's architecture and history guarantees that we will be a, this will be a wonderful presentation. So thank you very much, Earl, and thank you for your patience, Earl and everybody, for our technical um, uh, issues. And uh, Gina, let's see what happens. Okay, so we have Earl here on the line, and he is unfortunately through my speakerphone right now. So let's test how that is working. Um, and um, please let me know if, if you can't hear him. Okay. Um, let's see, Gina and Toby, uh, testing, testing. It sounds good. It, it, sounds, it good. sounds great. That sounds wonderful. Okay, very good. Well then I think we should get started. And uh, do you have the first image up on the screen? We have the 16 counties, 16 stories of early main houses. Title on. Oh, and I now have the first house on. Okay, very good. Fine. Well, um, it's a, a pleasure to uh, be with everyone this afternoon in this uh, relatively new medium. Um, I've done a lot of lecturing, but I don't think I've ever done any virtual lecturing quite like this, but uh, we'll give it a try this afternoon. Um, I was asked by Greg some weeks ago to provide this program. Uh, it's very much in the spirit of our bicentennial, uh, although certainly um, uh, recent uh, circumstances have uh, made it a little difficult in places to celebrate the bicentennial. I think we can do it this afternoon by looking back at uh, history in Maine, uh, the development of our 16 counties and picking uh, one historic house in each of the counties to spotlight. Uh, now this was not an easy task because there are a great many uh, wonderful early buildings. One of the criteria uh, that we used was to um, try and get a house and we were successful in all counties that dates uh, before 1820, so that um, this would be houses that were here uh, 200 years ago or more, uh, and were here in the period when Maine became a state in 1820. Our first house is probably familiar to many. Uh, it's really an icon in Maine architecture. It's kind of where Maine architecture begins uh, in terms of surviving buildings. Um, it's the McIntyre Garrison House in New York. 1707 to 1712 has a very distinctive structure in that it is built of log uh, with uh, overhanging second floor uh, surrounding all four sides. The tradition, of course, is that these garrison houses were built uh, in uh, developing communities in the 17th and early 18th century for protection in the uh, French and Indian War period. Um, this is a view of the house um, as it appeared in the 1930s when it was recorded by the Historic American Building Survey. And if we can go to the next image. Uh, we're looking now at a late 19th century photograph of the house, uh, showing it before its uh, circa 1910 uh, restoration. And as you can see in the 18th century, the family added uh, a three bay addition to the left, and that was taken off uh, about 1910 when the house was brought back to its uh, original garrison house proportion. Uh, one of the fascinating things about this house is that uh, not only is it probably the oldest intact uh, dwelling house surviving in Maine, uh, but also it has been uh, in the same family uh, throughout its history. There is a family association uh, that preserves this house. Next, please. And now we see a couple uh, more modern day views of the house. This is uh, from the rear, uh, looking out to the river. And next, please. Uh, here we're seeing uh, the front view and side view. Again, you can get the uh, sense of, of this uh, very distinctive uh, form of construction. Um, 
there are approximately a hundred or so more or less intact uh, 17th century houses uh, surviving in Massachusetts. Uh, in Maine, uh, maybe just a few parts of 17th century houses, uh, maybe not. Uh, and uh, this one really is our earliest intact example that gives us a sense of what some of those earliest structures uh, may have been like. Uh, next, please. Uh, we now go to Cumberland County uh, that was formed in 1760. Of course, the original county was York, 1652. And then as further development took place in the state, began to move slightly northward uh, along the coast, um, there was a petition uh, to the Massachusetts General Court to create two new counties, Cumberland in 1760 and Lincoln in 1760. And here we're seeing a house built just five years before the county was created in 1755. Again, probably well known to many, uh, the George Tate House in Stroudwater. Uh, it's one of the oldest structures in Portland proper uh, because, of course, the peninsula itself uh, was destroyed four times in its history, uh, but Stroudwater managed to escape some of those destructions uh, and has some very early buildings surviving in it. Um, it's a wonderful building, gamble roof, which is unusual for Maine, even more unusual, the recessed uh, clear story on the third uh, floor, which for part of the history of the building was covered over in the 19th century. Uh, next, please. This is the house actually showing uh, that um, distinctive clear story when it was when it was covered over in the 19th and into the early 20th century uh, and this is a sort of circa 1900 photograph of the house um, showing it in a deteriorating condition um, it was rescued uh, in 1931 uh, by the main chapter of the national society of colonial names uh, done uh, very thoroughly its restoration uh, and um, is open as a historic house museum. Next, please. Um, the house is quite uh, severe on the exterior, very handsome lines with the uh, triangular pedimented uh, doorway, uh, but it's really the interior that has uh, this glorious uh, Georgian woodwork in it. Here is uh, the narrow staircase that turns its way up in front of the great central chimney in the small uh, entry hall. And next, this is one of the really interesting uh, woodwork features of the house. Uh, this is in the parlor to the right as you enter. Um, it's this beautiful Georgian carved uh, 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 corner cupboard uh, with the shell motif. And you can also get a sense of some of the raised uh, paneling in the wainscot. Uh, the uh, major rooms have full uh, raised paneling uh, in uh, on their principal walls where the fireplaces are. Uh, the house was built by George Tate, uh, who came to uh, the Falmouth, now Portland area, about 1750. He was a mast agent uh, to procure masts for the Royal Navy, uh, and he lived in the house until his death about 1790. Next, please. Now we move on to Lincoln County, which is the second of the counties to be created in 1760. Again, a very familiar icon of Maine architecture, the Nichols Saltwell House on the Main Street of Wiscasset, built between uh, 1807 and 1811. It is a classic example of a grand three-story uh, federal mansion. Uh, this form of the great three-story house uh, started uh, in Boston about 1795. One of the earliest was the Harrison Gray Otis House, uh, attributed to Bullfinch. Then it moved up the coast uh, to Salem, to Newburyport, to Portsmouth, to Portland. And finally, we find it uh, in Wiscasset, which was a thriving port before the embargo of 1807. Beautiful facade, arched uh, uh, doorway, Palladian window on the second floor, and then uh, uh, elliptical window, arch window on the third floor, pilasters across the second and third floors, match boarding across the front, very elegant uh, exterior. 
As we move interior to the interior, we also find some great architectural features, uh, a really monumental uh, central hallway. Uh, we're looking now from back of that hallway toward uh, the arch doorway with the side lights and we begin to see at the right uh, the beautiful uh, circular staircase. Next please. Uh, now we are uh, moving up to the circular stair from the first floor to the second and now we're on the uh, uh, top floor, the third floor, uh, looking down uh, with this uh, wonderful oval motif uh, that is created uh, by the circular stair. Um, Captain William Nichols, who built this house, uh, had only a short time to enjoy it. He died in 1815, and then for most of the 19th century, the house, due to its large size, um, was uh, a local hotel. It was bought in 1899 by Alvin Sotwell from Cambridge, uh, became his summer family home until uh, the 1950s uh, when it was willed to historic New England, and it too is uh, open uh, to the public uh, during the summer. Next, please. Here's just a, a detail from the exterior looking out of the third floor uh, arched or elliptical window uh, with the leaded glass uh, uh, ovals. And here, uh, just to give you a sense of how the public rooms operate in this house, uh, if you were entering the house, these this would be the double room on the left. In the background at the left uh, is uh, one of the parlors, and then in the foreground, we're in the dining room. Uh, with very uh, restrained but very handsome uh, period woodwork uh, from the federal period. We're now moving on to our fourth county. This is Hancock County, uh, primarily along the coast, uh, upper coast, uh, and founded in 1790. And we're looking here at the Reverend Jonathan Fisher House in Blue Hill, built in 1814. Uh, the Reverend Fisher was a Harvard graduate. Um, he came to Blue Hill in 1796 uh, to serve as the first uh, settled minister for the community. And he was a Renaissance man. Uh, he was an architect. He was an artist. Uh, he was a, a writer. He was uh, a creator of furniture, um, a, a fascinating, uh, multi-talented individual who for many years of his life, kept a journal that was in the 20th century decoded uh, by uh, Mary Allen Chase, the authoress, and her sister. And then uh, she published a, a, a wonderful uh, life of Fisher that's uh, very well worth reading. And there have been some uh, excellent recent books on Fisher, including a very recent one on his furniture. Uh, it's an interesting house architecturally in that uh, most houses from the colonial and federal period uh, have central symmetrical uh, arrangements, but here Fisher has done something that is beginning to be done in uh, in southern New England in the federal period, uh, the side hall plan, uh, the entrance to the left, uh, and again, a very uh, distinctive and uh, sort of severe treatment for the exterior um, with this very uh, broad uh, uh, fenestration between the windows and the roof line. Next, please. Here's a photograph of the house uh, in the late 19th century with some of Fisher's descendants. The house was uh, in the family until the mid 20th century, and then it was uh, restored and again uh, opened during the summer uh, through the uh, Jonathan Fisher Association. Uh, here we're looking at the interior of the house. We're seeing the staircase at the left and then uh, looking uh, into the hallway and, and one of the principal rooms. And as you can see, um, a, a, quite a contrast uh, to uh, the elaborate uh, federal interior of the Nichols Sotwell House in West Cassett, uh, but only a, a few years uh, separate these two houses. Uh, this is much more kind of frontier feeling uh, with 
basically just using the vertical boarding uh, for the wall trim, uh, the open uh, aspect of the, of the framing, the framing very visible, um, a, a, an interesting contrast, a little more feeling of the, of the frontier. Now, we move further on up the coast uh, to uh, Washington County, and uh, this is a county that, again, was, was founded in 1790, created in 1790, and there are some really wonderful several period houses from uh, the earlier period of settlement in Washington County. Um, you French, of course, just gave us a wonderful presentation on Eastport, and there are a number of very distinctive uh, federal houses there. But here, we're in Columbia Falls, and we're looking at really one of the masterpieces of federal architecture in Maine. Uh, the Ruggles House, built for Thomas Ruggles, uh, who was a shipbuilder and sawmill owner, uh, designed and constructed by Aaron Sherman, who was an architect builder from Massachusetts, who worked in um, uh, in Washington County in the 18-teens and 20s. Um, instead of the full three stories, it's now two stories. The design is actually very much based on a plate in Asher Benjamin's Country Builder's Assistant, uh, 1797. The arched or fan doorway at the center, the Palladian window above, uh, the beautiful symmetry of the facade, the use of the match boarding to give it a sense of, of, uh, of masonry, uh, and then these, these lovely carved drapes uh, over the first story windows, these, these festooned uh, drapes. Um, next, please. The house, um, as happens to old houses, we start with the Tate House. By the early 20th century, it was in a, a state of neglect and deterioration. Fortunately, um, there was a Ruggles descendant who lived in, in Columbia Falls. She cared very deeply about the house. Uh, she rallied people around it. Uh, and by the 1950s, it was restored and opened to the public as an historic house museum. Uh, these are, uh, this is just a, a detail of those elegant carved um, uh, festoons that occur over the first story windows. Uh, Aaron Sherman was not only a very masterful architect, but apparently he or people on his construction team uh, were also uh, wonderful carvers. Uh, here are two historic American building survey photographs uh, of the of the interior stair hall. Uh, at the left, we see what we would call a, a flying stair. It's a, an unsupported stair that goes to a landing and breaks uh, onto a mezzanine that uh, serves the way to uh, gain entrance to the upper uh, floor rooms, the bedrooms. Um, there are other examples in Maine of the flying staircase, including at the McCollum House in Portland, connected to the Portland Museum of Art. Uh, this is a very delicate and very beautifully created one. And then to the right, uh, we're looking at that landing. We're at that landing as it breaks and goes up to the second floor. Now we're moving inland uh, to Kennebec County, along the Kennebec River. Uh, Kennebec County was created in 1799. And we're looking at a house that just uh, slightly predates 1799, the Vaughn Homestead in Hollowell of 1794. Uh, the house was uh, built from designs by Charles Vaughn for his brother, Benjamin Vaughn. Vaughns are a fascinating family. Uh, Samuel and his son, Benjamin, uh, were um, uh, major figures in, in, in England before and during the revolution. Uh, and then they came along with Charles and other members of the family to America. They were, they were really supporters of the, of the American revolution. Um, through a family connection, um, there was a, an inheritance of large tracts of land along the Kennebec River modern day Hollowell, uh, and so the family settled there. Uh, Benjamin uh, moved in with his family in 1797, and this house uh, has been connected with the Vaughn family for seven generations. Uh, it is now uh, a, a, 
nonprofit trust uh, and is, again, open to the public. The section at the left was added in the 1880s, done very skillfully um, to blend in with the original house. Uh, it's kind of living room, uh, uh, music room. Here's uh, an early 20th century view of the house uh, with the garden and the house in the background. There also is adjacent to the Vaughn homestead uh, a large tract of beautiful land called the Vaughn Woods, uh, which again is uh, open to the public. And here from the family photo album, and there are literally seven generations of uh, correspondence, of manuscripts, documents, photographs. This is a turn of the century view of uh, some of the family members uh, enjoying uh, the family homestead uh, in the winter. Now we move further inland to Oxford County, which was created in 1805. And here we have uh, a wonderful late 18th century house in Hiram, Maine, uh, 1785 built by John Watson, who was a veteran of the revolution. Uh, he came to Hiram uh, shortly after, after the revolution, uh, built his house near uh, a river, which was not such a good idea because it was swept away in a great freshet. And so he moved to higher ground and built this uh, lovely uh, uh, post-colonial, post Georgian house with the hip roof and the great central chimney, uh, the arched uh, doorway with the fan light. Federal is maybe just a little bit later. Uh, this often happened to late 18th century houses. Uh, the house uh, was acquired uh, in the 1940s by Francis and Constance O'Brien. Uh, Francis O'Brien is remembered by many as the Dean of Maine Antiquarian Bookman, uh, was a bookman a uh, bookseller for over 60 years in Portland, and he and his wife Constance used this as their summer home, and they added uh, the arched uh, wings uh, to left and right. Uh, here we're in one of the arched wings. Uh, these uh, were added uh, in the 1970s uh, by the O'Briens. Uh, very much uh, in the in the spirit of uh, of Georgian architecture, uh, and uh, they basically uh, Mr. O'Brien needed more room for his books. Here is uh, the dining room, again very restrained um, late 18th early 19th century woodwork, and similar in feeling to that. Um, Entrance way, that stair hall for uh, Jonathan Fisher's house of 1814. This is the entrance hall and staircase for the John Watson house of 1785. Now we move inland and further northward to the county of Somerset, founded in 1809. And not long after Somerset County was created, uh, the Western Homestead was built along the river in Madison in 1817, built by Benjamin Weston. Um, it was in the family for uh, most of its history. It's a classic two and a half story uh, federal uh, farmhouse, in this case with double chimneys, so it allows for a more commodious stair hall. Here's a side view of the Western Homestead uh, with its L uh, and uh, with its uh, uh, sheds and, and carriage houses. Uh, I have a wonderful personal memory of this. Um, spent summers in Scout Egan for about 15 years when I was growing up, and my parents and I would explore the whole area. And one day, we just went down this long road to the river, not knowing what we would find. And there was the Western Homestead. We knocked on the door elderly member of the family was there and she took us through and um, at that point uh, there were uh, multi-generations of collections as we see in this photograph of uh, western uh, family treasures it was it was sort of like stepping into another dimension we now go to the central part of the state and uh, to uh, Penobscot County founded in 1816. We're looking at the William Coburn House in Orono, uh, built about 1780. I suspect, um, again, we're dealing with um, a, 
federal doorway, one that was added a little bit later, maybe 1810, 1820 or so. Uh, but this, by tradition, was built by uh, William Coburn, who was one of the first settlers of uh, Orno uh, after the revolution. Next, please. Um, Waldo County, 1827, Belfast is the county seat. This wonderful building, which is still very much with us today, uh, with its uh, great sloping gable roof and its big central chimney, um, you see this uh, as you uh, enter the east side of uh, Belfast. If you're going northward, it's on the left. Um, this house was built in 1795 by uh, uh, Jerome Stevenson. Again, like John Watson from Hiram, a veteran of the Revolution, moved to Belfast about 1784. Initially, this was his home, and then about 1800, uh, he converted it into a tavern, and it was operated by the Stevenson family as a tavern until 1852. It was known as the Black Horse Tavern. And one of the amazing survivals, uh, still with the house today, uh, is uh, the 1800 tavern sign uh, with the black horse and with uh, Jay Stevenson's name. And here is the house today. We're now going back inland uh, to Franklin County, uh, which was established in 1838. And we're looking at a very handsome uh, federal period house of uh, about 1820. It's believed to have been built just before 1820 called the Holmes Craft Homestead in Jay. And it is owned by the Jay Historical Society. It was restored by them uh, and it houses uh, their collection. This is an old photograph of the house. Uh, again, reminiscent of the, of the Tate House and the house at Columbia Falls, the Rebels House. Um, uh, apparently, uh, there was a period in, in Maine when Tate was rather sparse, uh, rather unavailable, and these houses were just allowed to weather. Uh, this shows uh, the Holmescraft House at the right, the L that is still there, and then the long L and connecting to the barn uh, that disappeared uh, sometime in the 20th century. Here's the nice, uh, very demure, very restrained uh, federal period staircase uh, in the entrance hall of the Holmes Craft House. Now we're in Piscataquis County. We're, we're getting further northward, further inland. And we have a very interesting uh, cave style house, Sebec, built in 1816 by a man named Ichabod Young, who operated a fulling mill uh, in Sebec. The house is of particular interest because, as you can see by this uh, old black and white photograph, um, there are uh, remarkable murals and stencil decoration in this house. Uh, the stencils are very much in the style of Moses Eaton. Uh, he was probably the most well-known, most well-documented of, uh, of the stencil makers. Uh, if we could go back for just a moment. I think we flipped forward there. Um, or maybe I flipped forward. <laughs> uh, hold on just a minute. We're, well, we'll just pass over that. Um, we're moving now to the photograph that shows the tall clock um, and the wonderful weeping willow um, stencils. Okay, now we are in our northernmost county, uh, Aristic County. Uh, formed in 1839. Um, in doing this presentation, I, I, I was at, oh, oh goodness, I'm sorry. I have just hit something that I should and have advanced all of these. I will get back to where I was. Sorry about this. Bear with me. Okay, um, we are back at the Black Hawk Tavern, Putnam Tavern in Holden. I promise not to uh, advance more quickly than I should. Um, and um, 
I was just about to say, Aroostook 1839, um, this is just at the period when uh, the military road is built uh, from, from Bangor to Holton in the 1820s, uh, and uh, at the time also of the uh, boundary dispute in the 1820s and 30s, uh, which leads to the brief uh, Aroostook War. This house, however, uh, is much earlier than that. Um, it's 1813, um, and it is it is a house that was built uh, by Samuel Wormwood, who was a, a, a carpenter uh, from Alfred, um, and it was built for Aaron Putnam, uh, and then uh, later on owned by his son, uh, Blackhawk Putnam, uh, who was uh, an officer in the Civil War. Now we're in our 14th county <laughs> as we do this whirlwind tour of, of Maine. Androscoggin, uh, founded in 1854, and we're looking at a much earlier house, the Nathaniel Osgood House in Durham of 1785. Wonderful house that again has that same kind of feeling that the John Watson House of 1785 has. Um, squarish, hip roof, sort of uh, late or post-Georgian with the big uh, central chimney, and the the classic uh, late 18th century doorway with the, uh, the fluted pilasters and the triangular pediment. Second Hawk County uh, was founded in 1854. And we're looking here at a house that's very appropriate for the bicentennial. Uh, this is a house that was built as a summer home by our first governor, William King. Uh, William King um, was born uh, in 1768 in Scarborough. Uh, he moved after the revolution to Thompson, where he was a shipbuilder. Uh, and then he moved to Bath, where he continued the shipbuilding, the lumbering business, merchant, became a very successful uh, individual from a business standpoint. And then uh, in the uh, early 1800s, he became uh, very politically involved. And in many ways, he is the father of statehood. He's the individual who played the, the single greatest leadership role in moving Maine towards statehood. And then in 1820, he was elected our first governor. Um, he certainly uh, was in the vanguard, not only of, uh, of commerce and of politics, but also of architecture, because when he built uh, this summer house for himself, uh, just a little north of the, of the downtown area of Bath, along the river uh, in 1812, um, he used uh, large uh, floor-to-ceiling um, Gothic revival windows, arched windows, uh, with uh, uh, lancet windows at the top. And uh, this this was really, this style had never been used to our knowledge before in Maine, very rarely used before uh, in New England. Um, and normally in the early period of Gothic revival in New England, it was used not for homes, but for churches. A good example is Christ Church in Gardner, 1818 to 1820, which is our earliest uh, Gothic revival church. Uh, and also the use of granite, of stone, was very early as well. And here's a postcard view from the early 20th century of the house. Um, it's called the Stone House locally, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a real landmark both for its history and for its architecture. There's a close-up of one of those extraordinary windows. We end our journey in Knox County, uh, which is the last of the counties to be created in 1860. And we're looking at the Ebenezer Alden House of 1797 uh, in Union. Um, very traditional in form, uh, very much uh, still wedded to the 18th century, two and a half story, gable roof, central hall, plan, central entrance. Uh, but we can see by the doorway that the, and the doorway both on the left and the right, uh, that the federal style is now uh, in, in vogue. And if we 
look into the history of this house, we find uh, that uh, its uh, builder owner, Ebenezer Alden, was an architect builder who came to Union uh, after the revolution uh, and who was involved among other projects in the construction of General Henry Knox's house Montpelier in Thomaston of 1793-94, which was the first major use of federal style architecture for a home in Maine. So it's not surprising to find Ebenezer Alden using the more delicate federal style um, of the 1790s and early 1800s for his own home. Here's a, a wonderful aerial view, um, shows the house at the right. Um, he was also involved in commerce. He had a little general store, and that's a little red building in the center, and then the big uh, 19th century barn. Uh, I show you uh, this wonderful interior view just to give you a sense of the really rich uh, carved federal woodwork that is found uh, throughout the Ebenezer Alden house. Uh, this particular room features um, a, uh, a mantelpiece that comes right out of one of the popular uh, federal style uh, design books of the period. Uh, this uh, is from uh, William Payne's uh, The uh, the Practical House Carpenter, a book that was first published in London and then republished uh, in America. And we end with this delightful view of uh, uh, the, uh, the Ebenezer Alden store, uh, set up as a general store with, uh, with a little bit of everything. So I, I, I leave you now, um, uh, although I guess maybe maybe I'm supposed to uh, try to field some questions as well, and I'm happy to stay on the line if that's appropriate, or if I've overrun my time, uh, well, I can, I can sign off. Thank you. Yeah, we, we will take some questions, and we have one actually waiting for you, Earl. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, Claudia did asked... Come, what, did that come across all right? It did. It was yeah, perfect. It was, it was lovely. So Claudia has a question. What makes the Weston yes. House federal? I'm sorry? What makes? What makes the Weston House federal? It, 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 it's two things. One, it's the period in which it's built, um, 1817. And it's also, I didn't really, I wasn't really able to show um, to any extent, uh, the the interiors, the the stair hall, the principal rooms, but all of the woodwork is from the federal period as well in that house. And um, one of the amazing things is that I'm not sure if it still survives now, but certainly when I went there back in the 1950s as a as a youngster. Um, some of the original federal period wallpapers were there from from the earliest period as well. Terrific. Um, next question is from Kathy. Can you recommend a good book about residential architecture in Maine? Yes, actually, um, uh, there's there there are, there are a number of, of good publications, but uh, probably the one to that's most accessible um, and. Hold on just a moment. I have it right here. Uh, let me grab it. This is a book called Historic Maine Homes, 300 Years of Great Houses, Photography by Brian Vandenbrink, and text by Christopher Glass, our good friend, architect from Camden, uh, published by um, the Down East Press, uh, and uh, now available uh, in paperback, uh, and uh, really a, 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 a wonderful uh, progression of Brian's beautiful photographs, literally from uh, McIntyre Garrison right up to modern times. Fantastic. Our next question is from Jane. Uh, where are other Moses Eaton stenciled interiors in Maine? And I'm thinking specifically here, are there any that are publicly viewable? Um, I'm not sure on that. Um, I, I know that um, at one point, uh, the Brick Store Museum 
had some panels, plaster panels that had his stenciling on it that were found in the Kennebunk, Kennebunkport area that were part of their museum display. Um, I'm not aware of um, of any um, any houses open to the public that that display Moses Eaton stencils, but I and I would welcome you know any of our listeners to 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 uh, uh, to add to that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there are some some very uh, good books uh, on um, the whole issue of both, of wall decoration, uh, both stenciling and and wall murals, uh, going back to the mid twentieth century with people like Jean Lipman and Nina Fletcher Little, who were among the first scholars to deal with this whole issue and popularize it, make people aware of it, um, and then most recently. Um, extraordinary book co-authored by Jane Radcliffe from here in Hollowell uh, on uh, the, uh, the, the Rufus Porter School of, uh, of Interior Decoration. Great. Um, and Bill asks, can you tell us how the Pownal the Pauna Borough Courthouse figures within <laughs> these wonderful homes you've presented? It's funny, I always just call it Pownal, so that kind of like did not roll off my tongue. I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, 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 can you repeat that? Uh, yes, uh, Bill's asking about the Palno Borough Courthouse and how it figures within the- Oh yeah, the Palno Borough Courthouse, sure. Well, um, of course, the, uh, one of the reasons, of course, it was, <laughs> you know, we have we have so many wonderful early buildings in Maine and uh, I, I, I knew, of course, by, by picking only one per county that we'd be excluding <laughs> lots of good ones, but let me just focus on the Palno Borough Courthouse. Um, it was built um, in 1761. Um, as I mentioned, Lincoln County was created in 1760. And uh, one of the impetuses to create Lincoln County uh, was um, the, the fact that the Kennebec proprietors wanted to develop their lands. They were a land holding company from Boston. They wanted to get settlers up into the Kennebec Valley. One of the ways in which to make settlers at ease was to create a new county um, that could actually have its own set of, 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 uh, of governing uh, forces, as well as, of course, fortification. So they built along the Kennebec River, they built uh, uh, Fort Shirley at Palboro, they built Fort Western uh, at Augusta, they built Fort Halifax in Winslow uh, for, uh, for protection of the settlers, and then they also built the Palboro Courthouse um, so that there, there could actually be uh, law in the county, and it was a multi-purpose building in which there was a family who lived there, it was a tavern for when people went there for the court sessions, there was a courtroom, uh, there were also where the county records were kept and so on, and um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting building, it's been owned and open to the public since the 1950s by the Lincoln County Historical Association. Okay. Terrific. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. That was all the questions.